ஓசோமாசமய தமசோமாஜோதிமயோர்மாமிரமய ஆவிராவீர்மேதிருத்தேதிணம் தேனமாம் பாஹி நித்தியம் may the divine lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light from death to immortality may the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us peace 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 vedanta and the art of uh, editing the <laughs> it it's not a very original title it was partly um inspired by some of you may be aware that a book had come some years ago called zen and the art of motorcycle repairing <laughs> <laughs> so the key terms in this title are uh, is vedanta art and editing so i would like to say a little bit about these three terms uh, before proceeding further many of you have been coming to vedanta for some time or a long time and we all those of us who have been acquainted with vedanta have an idea of what vedanta is and what as vedanta students we can or should do and this is a something that many vedanta students have discussed and debated among themselves about if someone comes and asks any of us i want to study vedanta what do we do and i would imagine that most of us might refer them to some book or ask them to listen to some podcasts or or there are many different ways we might try to introduce a friend or someone to vedanta and all of these things are helpful certainly but it's also important to remember that to be a vedanta student is not primarily a matter of doing anything it's primarily a matter of being someone the entire vedantic world view can be put in a very nutshell and just simply this that if we look around us and if we look within us and if we are honest we will see a mess <laughs> and we have every one of us consciously or unconsciously are trying to figure out how to how to remove this mess and this mess can be removed can be seen this this project of removing this mess inner and outer can be seen as something that needs to be done or we can look at it in a different way and that is maybe i may not be seeing things clearly that maybe if i change the way i see then what i see may change along with my change of perception and that is what some of these early vedanta thinkers began doing that if i change the world changes for me and so their proposition was this that maybe our self understanding may not be very accurate the way we see ourselves the way we would answer the question who am i maybe the answer to that question can be refined can be made better and if i am able to understand myself better if i am able to understand who i am have a clearer understanding who of who i am then this i which experiences the world the world will change and that is primarily the vedantic position that 
external change is directly related with internal change. That in reality, I am very different from who I think I am. For most of us, we have clearly an identity that I am a human being. And as a human being, we know we are mortal. We know that there are all these limitations that our body, mind and ego put upon us. And if we think that that's just how things are and just accept them, then there is no evolution. One of the things that, that comes to mind is about evolution when we say, even those of us who believe in evolution, we might say that uh, we came from the apes, we evolved from the apes. Uh, the question that can sometimes come is, well, if we evolved from the apes, why haven't all the apes become human beings? Well, well there are still apes around. And so, which among these apes evolved into human beings and which among these apes remained apes? So every stage of evolution, whether it's the fish or the insects or the mammals, all of those stages are still there and yet out of those stages human beings have come. So of course no one knows how it all happened but, but it's interesting to speculate that it's possible that those among these different species just accepted their situation in life as default. Right? That's how things are. We just got to accept it. They never evolved. But those among the species who said, no, we can do something different. We can try, we can do better. So maybe when the fish who were just limited to that world within inside water, maybe some among the fish thought, hey, there is this whole big world outside. Why don't, we, why don't I try to go out and see? And maybe with repeated efforts like that, they biologically, they acquired the ability to, 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 to survive outside water. Again, just speculation, but, but it's, it's helpful to think this way. And which gives us a clue that if we are satisfied with our, well, none of us is satisfied with our present situation, but, but if we accept it as if there is no other way out, then we won't evolve. And Vedanta says there is a way out. What Vedanta says is we don't have to accept the status quo. That I, I may think of myself now as a mortal, vulnerable human creature, but that's not who I really am. In reality, I'm infinite. In reality, my true nature is divine. In reality, I'm immortal. This body may go, this mind may have its ups and downs, but I remain unchanged, unmoved. Now that's the proposition. It might seem, it might seem not very, um, um, well, let me put it this way. Um, some people are astounded, but those of us who have been coming to Vedanta, we just kind of say, well, of course, that's how things are. But when sometimes people hear this for the first time, it just looks, doesn't really seem to make sense. But the good news is that this is not simply a speculation, that there ha have been people in every generation. And this Vedantic thinking has been around for thousands of years, who have actually seen that the, the human identity is not their real identity, that there is something deeper within us, that there is something deeper reality within, which is who I truly am. And so, Going back to how we began, so studying Vedanta really means looking deeply within ourselves and discovering who we really are and being that infinite being that we are. And being is something that can be done anywhere. For doing, we need time, we need energy. And of course, if we look upon Vedanta as something to be done, then there is all this problem about how much time should I give to Vedanta? I have these other things to do in life and so on. But if Vedanta is about being, then it doesn't conflict with anything, right? For instance, now we are human beings. Now being a human being doesn't come in the way of me carrying out my work because whether I'm cooking or gardening or, or whatever I'm doing in life, I'm simultaneously being a human being. 
So being a human being does not come in the way. Exactly in the same way, being a divine being will not come in the way no matter what our duties and responsibilities are. And so looking upon Vedanta as primarily being is very helpful. Art. And so I, I mentioned this about being because if Vedanta is seen as being, then it, it it has a role to play, whether you are editing or whatever we are doing. So then Vedanta and the art of editing may not seem so disconnected if we just see Vedanta as, as being. But let me say something about art. Now, there are people whom we recognize as artists. But in some way, every one of us is a conscious or unconscious artist. But what, what would doing art or what would being artistic mean? Again, there are many different ways of understanding it, but maybe I would think that doing whatever it is that we are doing as efficiently as possible and that maximum efficiency in any activity occurs when the I gets out of the way, when this little I so as long as we feel I'm doing something, um, well, that's work. But when this I gets out of the way, then whatever is done, even if I'm simply vacuuming my room, that can be done in a very artistic way. If I'm arranging flowers, that can be done in an artistic way. But, but that I should get out of the way. In the Gita, Krishna, in the 15th chapter of the Gita, there is one verse where Krishna says in Sanskrit, it goes like this, Tameva chadyam purusham prapadye yatap pravrittihi prasrita purani. Which simply means this, that all creative impulse comes from God alone. Everything that is done in this world is done by God, by this some divine force. Which is why we, when we think about God as creator, which is a very common way of understanding among a large section of humanity. But it's helpful to see that even seeing God as a creator, not to think of it as some one-time activity a few centuries ago or a few thousand years ago, God created this world and then left us here stranded. Uh, but seeing creativity is, is an ongoing activity, that every thing that is being created is really the divine creation that is occurring every moment. And everything that you and I think that I am creating, whether even it's even cooking, you, you cook a dish, that's creation. Now, uh, everything is really being created by the divine force, but it's my little ego that then appropriates that divine activity and says, I did it. I think if, if we see God as, as, as some divine being watching from above, then God must be smiling all the time, every time we use the pronoun I. Because well, God might say, well, I'm doing everything and these fellows think they are doing anything. So anyway, well, one of the things about um, art, so I think it's possible to look upon art in a much more broader canvas. And I specifically use the word editing because the creativity itself can be seen um, as having two levels. There is the, the primary creativity and there is the secondary creativity. Um, now because I have had a chance to do a little bit of writing in life, I will primarily speak in terms of uh, editing texts. But all of this will apply to other creative acts also, such as painting and sculpting and, and many different things. So, um, writers have, have how, there are, there are lots of workshops held for writers about how to write, and I know among the audience some really brilliant writers are, are present here. Uh, one of the things that, that is often said about writing is that the process of writing and the process of editing are two different things. And 
many writers know this so what they say is when you write just write don't think about whether it's grammatically correct but don't think about whether it makes sense don't think about how other people will perceive it don't think about the reviews that you're going to get don't think about anything here is this impulse to put your ideas on paper put them that and and, and the best writing is done not because you want to write something because you can't stop yourself from writing that's this creative force which which you do it not because you feel like it but you must you 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 just can't stop yourself so that's that's the primary activity primary creativity something that happens in spite of yourself is as if someone or something is pushing you to do whether it's again painting sculpting or whichever activity now after that first draft uh, is is on paper sometimes it's helpful to even just keep it aside and not even look at it for a day or two and then you revisit this first right draft that you have done and the next you start editing you look at it and you say oh this doesn't make sense i can substitute one word by another word maybe i can uh, add a few quotation give some references and so on so that's the editing part and that's considered the secondary creativity the primary creativity many artists have felt this the primary creativity um is really not done by the artist at all in fact many have experienced it you, you and um, those who have done uh, writing can see if you look at some of your old writings um you just i have felt it for one i can't speak for everybody uh, that you just read something and say i didn't i don't think i wrote this so so and i i'm sure there's nothing very exceptional about this i think in mean, artists in every field may have experienced that that when something has come and then you feel that someone else did it and that's what i mean by uh, the i when the i gets out of the way some of the best work that we do uh, occurs same thing with regard to relationships as well in fact relationship itself can be seen as a very creative activity in any relationship as long as the i is strong then uh, then it's not that great but if the i gets out of the way then then something wonderful something beautiful gets created so now applying this this whole editing background to to where, where does vedanta come into this and it's this that a vedanta student um one thing good about vedanta which which i found very uh, uh attractive when i was a student was that it always asks us to keep our eyes open that don't don't accept anything blindly accept only that which makes sense to you and and that was great so as a vedanta student when we open our eyes and look out at the world and we also open our mind and look inside um we might see that as i said in the beginning things are not that great both inside and outside and they need editing the world needs editing and the inner world needs editing also now as far as the primary creative creation goes it's already been done so the world that's that's not your and my problem the world has already been created and what's happening inside is already there so the secondary creativity editing is something that we can try to do is there any way that i can become an editor of the world that i live in both inner and outer it so happened that that um, from the time i joined the the order became a monk and that successively in the different monasteries i lived i have had a chance to live with with monks who were writers and editors themselves and so that that may have somehow influenced my way of thinking um 
when I joined in Bombay about 42 years ago, the head of the center was a disciple of Swami uh, Akhandananda, a great disciple of Ramakrishna. And so he said, he was an editor of a journal, a Bengali journal in India for more than 10 years. And so he said that when he went for advice, when he began his editing work, he went for advice to another uh, elderly monk of our order and said, mm, give me some tips because here is this responsibility of editing that has been given to me. And then later on, I, he used to tell the rest of us, uh, the younger ones, that what this monk told about the golden rule for editors was keep what you can, cut what, where you must. And the idea was this, that um, editors wield a lot of power they can they can modify they can change the the submissions that are sent to them um, and and in some ways if you have to tell the author that that essay or article can't be published it's a very thankless job and i've had to do a lot of it during the time because no matter how sweetly you tell the person now this can't be published they're not going to be happy but the editor has a great responsibility because whoever has submitted something for publication, um, there has been some creative process gone into that. And just because as editor you have the red pen in your hand, just can't mindlessly go on cancelling and changing. And so this was the golden rule, that ideally, whatever can be kept, keep it as it is. But there may be a few things that need change, and that you must change. So anyway, that was told as a golden rule. So can we apply that golden rule as we try to edit this kind of a, a manuscript of the world that is put before us and a manuscript of our inner world that is put before us? So what are the kind of things we might need if we have to use our editing skills? The first thing for, for any, any editor would be to, to understand three things that are important. First is, based on that golden rule, I must improve whatever is possible. In, in, as far as editing the world goes, that's something that is being done by activists and social reformers in every generation, in every century. They looked at the world and they feel some things need to be changed, some things need to be improved, and that's what they do. Now, spiritual seekers, those who take spiritual life seriously, are those who want to edit their inner lives. So, and we can do both. It's not as if we have to choose between one or the other. But it's helpful to remember that our ability to edit the external world or to improve or change the external world is directly related to our ability to improve and change our inner world. The challenge or the difficulty that we experience in life today is everyone is out to change the world or improve it and no one has time to change themselves or improve themselves. Even those who sit at the table for let's say peace negotiations to bring peace among communities or even nations it's important that those people have to be at peace themselves. If those people are disturbed within, then they cannot bring peace outside. And that's, that's, it's, it seems as if it's simply common sense, but that's, that is sometimes often forgotten. And therefore, as editors, and applying that golden rule, it would seem that we must try to improve, if we can, we must try to change things if they must, if, if they do need change. That's what something we have to do. And it's possible that in some situations, we might find that we have neither the ability to improve nor the ability to change. Then we pray. So improve, change, and pray. These are the three things that a, a Vedanta student uh, might find beneficial to do. Because sometimes we might have the best intentions to go about and improve and change things. We might have hundreds of ideas about how to do it. 
but it may not always be practicable, may not always be even possible for us to do so. At that time, it makes sense to then step back and pray. N not because prayer is something as a last resort. Prayer, prayer is, is a very powerful practice, and I think it's often underrated. There is so much can be achieved, but because it is so subtle, because its effect is not something that can be measured, uh, we tend to, well, many people do, tend to not take prayer seriously. Uh, but those who have prayed in their lives and have found that it works will, will, will never be able to forget the power of prayer. One, one small footnote on prayer is, sometimes we might think that some prayers are answered and some are not. But the reality is that every prayer is answered, just not with a yes. I think, it, but, but no, no, no is an answer. And I think, I would think that we are lucky that not, not all of our prayers are answered. Because we really don't know what's good for us. And if we truly believe that God loves us, if that's how our perception of God is, then even when our prayers on, are answered with a no, I think that's an act of tremendous love. I think that's how a devotee sees it. That if I want, and that's what we do, even as parents, as grandparents, when your children, grandchildren come to you and ask, you don't give them everything. We use our judgment and we feel, oh, this is good for my kid. And you say yes. And when, when they ask for something which you feel is detrimental to their growth or something that's not good for you, you say no. Now you say no not because you hate them, but in fact because you love them. So even when we receive a no for an answer to a prayer, that's an act of tremendous love. And so therefore, I for one truly believe that every prayer is answered. So so let's let's see, what, what would a... Because we know there are good editors and there are bad editors. So what would be necessary to be a good editor? First thing would be clearly, um, we need a lot of patience, a lot of perseverance, a lot of humility. Uh, but we also need to, 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 we need the knowledge of the ideal even when someone is editing a piece of writing, that editor must have some idea about what an ideal piece of writing would be. I think that ideal is important. So similarly, if we want to bring about improvement in the world outside, every one of us might have some idea about what would be my ideal world. If I want to bring about an improvement within me as a person, then I must have some idea about what an ideal person would be. So that's the first requirement, to, to have an ideal. Swami Vivekananda once said that if a person with an ideal makes a thousand mistakes, then a person without ideal will make 50,000. The idea is that if we have an ideal, it's not that, it, that we won't make mistakes in life, but, but we will make fewer mistakes. However practical it may sound to say, well, I just take life as it comes, it's a bad idea. <laughs> I think it's, it's good to have some, some idea, like this is, this is the way to do things, or this is what I would like things to be like, or this is the kind of person I would like to be. Because if you have, however vague or hazy that idea may be, if you have that idea of, of what kind of a person I, I want to be, then I just have to look at myself and say, what kind of a person I am now? And then see what things need to be changed, what things need to be improved. It's as simple as that. We need um, an accurate self-assessment. I think for a good, to be a good spiritual seeker, we need the ability to look within and be honest with ourselves and, and, and see what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are. Every human being in the world, every person in the world has some strengths, some weaknesses. And we just have to identify 
what our strengths are. We have to identify, you don't have to go on advertising them to everybody, but within we know, well, this is what I'm good at, and this is what I'm terrible at. And then all that we need to do going forward is preserve my strengths. See that I don't fritter away the skills that I already have. And then once I've identified my weaknesses, make a conscious effort to eliminate them, remove them. Even one by one, that, that little book called The Imitation of Christ by Thomas A. Kempis, uh, he says in one place that if we identify one, one weakness that we have and try to eliminate one weakness every year, just one weakness every year, we will very soon find that we have become better as simply better as human beings. So there is, there is this self, I, uh, self examination is important. And those of us who, who are not able to do it may sometimes need external help. There is a story told about a person uh, who, was, who was thinking that he, he may have some complexes within, uh, that he's suffering from uh, inferiority complex. So he had a, a psychological test done and when the results arrived, his um, therapist or whoever told him, I have good news for you. You are not suffering from inferiority complex. You are inferior. <laughs> so, so don't, don't. So, but it's good to know. It's good to know so that I can then change myself. So we, really, we don't, we don't need, we don't need either an inferiority or a superiority complex. We just need to be just realistic. And that's, that's, that's important, that what, where I am now and where I want to be. And, and sometimes it's helpful to, to ask ourselves that the way my life is going now and the way I am now, if I continue to do what I am doing now, where will I be 20 years from now? Because let's say we can have an idea about 20 years from now or 30 years or whatever, whichever goal I have before me, what kind of a person I want to be? How do I see myself when I am 60 or 70? Or when I am a grandfather or a grandmother? How do I see myself? And then I can ask myself that the way I, I am now and the way I am doing things in my life, will I be what I want to be in future? And if I feel like now, if the way things are going now, that's not where I will reach, then of course I need to make some changes. And that's the importance of having some ideal before us. And sometimes it's also helpful to have an ultimate ideal and also some intermediate goals before. Because sometimes we might make the mistake of, and that's what sometimes happens, because oftentimes we read in, in, in these books, in the conversations of Ramakrishna, for instance, is God realization is the goal of life. To become enlightened, to become a Buddha is the goal of life. Well, great. But what happens is, well, after six months I find I'm nowhere near being a Buddha. I mean, that can be discouraging. It's like, am I making any progress at all? And so therefore it's helpful that even as we have some ultimate goal in life, to have some intermediate goals. <clears throat> and that's great. It's like you plan on, is that a water somewhere? Okay. Oh, let's see. If I'm planning to be, a <clears throat> to run, to run, to go be a marathon runner, now, if I've never run before, now 26 miles is long. Now, if I think that, oh, I will never be able to do it, but what many of these runners might do, let me keep my goal. Let me run, see if, if I can run half a mile. And if I can do it with some difficulty, maybe after some practice, I might be able to do it easy. Then I go one, two, three. And so we can increase our capacity that way. And so it's helpful to have an ultimate ideal and also some intermediate ideal. So we feel that we are, we are on the right track, that we are making progress. <coughs> Make, about making progress, I've just remembered one other, one other kind of story. I hope you don't mind. So here was this one person who, who uh, went to his spiritual teacher and said, um, uh, I've, been pra I've been meditating now for the last two years and nothing much is happening. So when, when will I have realization? And the teacher said, 
keep on practicing it will happen in due course it will happen but the student was very impatient no no i want realization i want it i just can't wait any longer and then the teacher said okay uh, are you willing to do what i ask you to do and the student said yes the teacher said okay next time it rains you're going to go out in the middle of the street take off your shirt stand with one hand raised for half an hour and then you will have realization and that really sounded weird <laughs> But the student was eager and he said, okay, if that's what my teacher wants me to do, I'll do that. And so next time it began raining, uh, he went out in the middle of the street, took off his shirt, stood with his one hand raised and, and everyone on the street was looking at him and like, who is this person? What is going on? And so anyway, so after doing that for half an hour, he goes back to the teacher and, the t and said, I did exactly as you told me. And the teacher said, so what happened? And then the student said, look, Left to myself, I would never have done such a crazy thing. But because you asked me to do it, I did it. Everyone on the street was looking at me. And then I just felt so idiotic. I just felt so crazy. I just felt I'm so, so such a silly thing for me to do. That I'm a fool. And then the teacher said, that's a good realization to begin with. <laughs> I told. So... So in a way, we, uh, we, are, we are getting realization every day about where I am, where I need to be, and what I need to do. So knowledge of the ideal is important. But second is, is studying. Study, studying whatever it is that we are called to edit upon. Again, now here we are talking about the world. So some deeper insight into the world or a deeper insight within ourselves is important because only then we will be able to improve where improvement is needed. We will be able to change where change is must. Or we will be able to say, this is something I will need to pray for, for God's help. This also, we will also learn, If sometimes when we are young, we think nothing is impossible. But as with age, we recognize that, that uh, not everything is possible. We also recognize that not everything needs to be changed. That things, some of the things are perfect as they are. We also recognize that we have more options inside than outside. That our freedom in the external world is limited. No matter how much we may boast our, of ourselves being a, a free society, a free country, free, we know. You can't drive with whatever speed you want on the road. There's only If there is a one-way street, you can't go. Otherwise, you, you will be fined for that. So we are not as free as we think. We can't do whatever we want. So when if there are rules and regulations which we are expected to obey, we are not really free. And so our freedom in the external world is limited. And that's good. We need laws. We need rules in for, for a community living, for a collective living to be harmonious. Granted, but inside, inside we have all the freedom we want, have. I can look at the world, understand the world, or look within myself and understand myself in whichever way I want. I can react, I can respond in whichever way I want. So there is this, a lot more options exist within than outside. And for a spiritual seeker, therefore, they strive to change the inner environment because the more I'm able to change inside my ability to change outside also improves sometimes the question can come in our in our lives about how much do we need to change and how much do we need to keep and that's the kind of question that everyone has to ask for themselves. There, I don't think there is any, any rigid open rule about this, about how much we can change. Swami Vivekananda, in his lectures on, on Karma Yoga, uh, points out that all efforts to change the world outside um, are limited in scope. Which is why we need reformers in every, every, every generation. None of us can change the world outside 
for better permanently. But the change inside can be made permanently. And the example that, that comes to mind is that, let's see if, if I find a hungry person and I go and feed that hungry person and I've done a good act. I have solved the problem of hunger in the world, not completely, but at least because of my good action, there is one less hungry person in the world. But I've not solved the problem permanently. After six hours or eight hours, that person is going to be hungry again. So I have done some amount of good to the world, but it's, it's very limited and it's, very, it's not by no means eternal. The person will be hungry again. So in the example that they give is about a dog's tail. Uh, no matter how often you straighten it, it's going to curl up again. So that's the nature of the world. And there have been reformers in every generation, in every community, trying to improve things. And then we you know things improve for a while, then they go back or become worse, and then a new generation of reformers have to come to improve them. But what about the change inside? That person who I helped, I can do it in a very egoistic way. I can think, oh, how wonderful I am. I am such the most helpful person in this world. Even humility can be... There are people who, are, who feel, I am the most humble person in this room. <laughs> so even humility can increase our ego, So that's, which is not really a real humility. But, but it is possible to help someone in a different way. And that is what karma yoga really means, that can I help someone in a completely selfless way? That if I help a hungry person without expecting anything in return, not even gratitude. Many of us help other people, but, but we get upset if they, and they are not grateful to us. But that's even beggarly, even to kind of expect a thank you from others. I mean, it will come if it is to come, but if someone is not grateful, then for us to feel upset, and that's again not karma yoga. But if I'm able to help someone without expecting anything in return, it purifies my heart a little bit. I become a better person. There is a, some real improvement within me. And that improvement will not disappear after eight hours. That person will become hungry again after eight hours, but that however small a transformation that has occurred within me, that will stick, that will stay. And therefore, the inner editing or inner change, inner improvement that we can do remains with us for a longer time. And as I said, the more we change inside, the better our chances are of changing outside. In fact, for a lot of times we don't even have to do anything. Just being a happy, peaceful person is already doing a lot of service around us. There is that story uh, often told about the, the what, what was his name, W. H. Auden, the British author, writer. There is a story, uh, some of you have heard about this. Uh, it seems that at one, one point in life, he had, he was, life seemed very dark and he didn't want to live anymore. And so he wanted to go and just commit suicide. And uh, I think probably this happened in New York and he went to Brooklyn Bridge and this was in the middle of the night and there was nobody and he almost climbed up and was about to jump inside to end his life. And at that point, a big truck passed by that road. And this, there was no traffic and this person who was driving the truck was merrily singing some joyful song completely oblivious about that there is a, some person on the, by, the, by the roadside about to end his life. And this, this driver was just driving and he passed by. And hearing that, 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 that joyful singing, uh, this author just, he stopped and he said, suddenly it appeared to him, what am I doing? There, is, there are things to live for in this life. There is such a thing as a joy. Just that Hearing of that joyful singing uh, triggered something in him. And he said he retraced his steps back and never again thought of ending his life afterwards. Now, think about that, that, that person who was driving the truck. Probably that person didn't even know that he saved a life. 
and so often times in 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 life when we think about service or helping people sure um helping the homeless the the hungry helping those who are in need that service uh, absolutely but we must also recognize that unconsciously unintentionally we may already be serving a lot of people so by just being peaceful kind loving ourselves just being peaceful and joyful um unbeknownst to ourselves we may be benefiting someone we know that we know that when we are in the company of people who are happy peaceful contented somehow it's very infectious we 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 feel uplifted we feel happy we feel joyful and and the opposite of this is also true that we really don't have to go we may think oh i have never hurt anybody maybe yes consciously we may not have hurt anybody but if i have a very surly uh a kind of a very angry uh demeanor angry angry way of personality and i am always um well i well, i'm not a happy person to be in the comp- in the company then then maybe some happy person comes and sees me and that person's happiness goes away <laughs> i I'm, i'm i'm really hurting the world so unconsciously we may be do, can do a lot of service unconsciously we can also do a lot of disservice and so therefore it's helpful to be and that self editing changing within ourselves what needs to be changed improving what needs to be improved will help us become the kind of person that people want to be with and one way of testing that is is trying to trying to find a place of solitude every day even if it's for a few minutes and to that extent many of you who come to a temple uh, or you find place uh, at home or some place where you spend a few th- minutes maybe in prayer in japa and meditation those are the kind of practices which encourage us to experience that solitude so when you close our eyes we shut the world outside and we are just with ourselves and our spiritual ideal so that's the solitude or you can go to some really solitary place uh, i was uh, earlier this week at the, at the kalbat caverns uh, in in uh, in in new mexico and uh, have any of you been there it's amazing it's 750 feet underground and um, the the ranger the park ranger who gave us a tour and there, there are lights there underneath and he said how did this cave appear to people uh it was a little over 100 years ago that they discovered it uh when they came of course there was no electricity that time and he switched off all the lights it was great i mean some people were terrified but but <laughs> but, no, but 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 it, it was amazing it was quiet i mean you could actually hear the silence and it was peaceful and it's a great place to be uh for so solitude now i think it's important if we want to take spiritual life seriously to recognize that at some level we are alone not lonely being lonely is very different from being alone uh, people can be surrounded by friends and family and yet feel lonely so that's a completely different thing but e- but experiencing our aloneness is very important to make progress in spiritual life and so uh it's good to practice being alone and the 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 if you have a practice of prayer and japa meditation it it helps us to experience that aloneness many people don't want to be alone um, we know sometimes there are people in whose home a television is running all the time whether or not people are watching it or if we are waiting at the airport for a long time and there's a flight is late people just pick up their phone and just call up friends not because there is anything urgent to convey just like they're just bored sitting by themselves and so many of us have experienced that if you're just by yourself and you're not doing anything and then we get bored now think about it for a moment if i am by myself and i am bored i'm in my own company and i it's boring 
So, so so if I cannot stand my own company, I have no right to inflict it on other people. If I find my company boring, no wonder others find it boring too. So if I want others to enjoy my company, I need to enjoy my company as well. And which better way to know whether I can truly enjoy my company or not is to see whether I enjoy the simple practices like prayer, meditation, study, because that's what I'm doing alone. And if I don't enjoy doing it, means really my company is very boring. With that really needs a major editing, I think. <laughs> that's so that so these are some of the ideas that that were kind of running in my head when I thought of this title uh, Vedanta and the and the art of editing. Essentially, the bottom line is this: that we find ourselves in a world that um, it doesn't seem like anybody ever asked us a choice, like where do you want to be? What do you want to do? Suddenly we are born and there are a lot of things we had no control over. So here is this world we find in ourselves into, uh, oftentimes with no idea about, clearly we don't know what's in the future. Uh, there is the past and we hopefully learn from the past and then decide what we must do in the present. Using our best knowledge, our skill, we just have to, as one of our Swamis used to say, just muddle our way through this life. Um, nobody has complete answers. We have to use our best judgment, do the best we can. There are things that we will get, get right and there are things that we will get wrong. And both ways we can learn. If I get something right, I know that that's the way I should do. If I get something wrong, then I know that next time some similar situation comes, I must try some different way. I shouldn't make the same mistake again. And that helps us. If you look at the mistakes that we make in life, how many of our mistakes are original mistakes? <laughs> Most of the mistakes we do are the mistakes we have been doing for years together. Which means that, and which is why they say, because we don't learn from our mistakes, history repeats itself. Not only in the lives of people, in the lives of nations, in the lives of civilizations. Look at history. Look at these nations that have risen and fallen, civilizations that have come and fallen. And it's the same old story. Now, we don't have control, neither is it our responsibility to change the whole civilization of the world. Whoever feels they feel like doing it, they can try. <laughs> what we can do, and that's completely within our ability to do is to try to improve ourselves, to try to change ourselves, to have some idea of what my ideal in life is, what an ideal human being is like, and try to approximate my life as close to that ideal life. And that would involve oftentimes a change in the way we think, a change in the way we relate ourselves to people around us, to our work, to the world, uh, and change in the way we work itself. And the ability to change it is the ability of an editor. And so I will conclude with a prayer that through God's grace, through the grace of Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, may we acquire the required skill to be good editors so that we can improve, change our own selves and then be a good instrument to try to bring about some positive, constructive change and improvement in the world around us. That we may become a blessing to ourselves and that we may become a blessing to the community of which we are a part and in general being a blessing to the world. So that's my prayer. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti